We're really excited to have, have Dr. Hoffman speak today. He's kicking off our seminar. Uh, as pre-cranial brain geologists, we know uh, nobody really knows multidisciplinary quite the way we do. And that's just what Dr. Hoffman is, right? So since early in his career, he's been bringing together sedimentology and structural geology to develop what we, what we know about Precambrian tectonics. His attention to detail and mapping and geochemistry taught us about intense climate conditions of the Neoproterozoic Snowball Earth. And today we have him here to give a, an evolutionary geobiological talk. So it doesn't get, get much more multidisciplinary than, than that. He completed his PhD at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland. It's where I'm from, Baltimore, uh, under Francis Petitjohn. This is where he uh, compared Paleoproterozoic sediment sequences of the Great Slave Lake with Phanerozoic geosynclines, highlighting similarity in tectonic processes separated by two billion years of geologic time. During his PhD, he became in, intensely fascinated with Precambrian stromatolites and doc documented their extensive presence in the Great Slave Lake carbonate succession, compared them with modern analogs. After his PhD, Dr. Hoffman joined the Geologic Survey of Canada. Amongst his work there, he spent uh, years mapping the east arm of the Great Slave Lake entirely and the Watmay origin. In 1992, Paul moved from the Geologic Survey of Canada to the University of Victoria, where he became interested in the Neoproterozoic, in part at the prompt of Dr. John Grotzinger. In 1994, Dr. Hoffman moved to Harvard University and his work on neo neoproterozoic strata in Namibia, with the help of colleagues and his students, ultimately made the then much more controversial concept of neoproterozoic snowball earth a robustly studied event in earth history. In 2008, Dr. Hoffman stepped down from teaching at Harvard and returned to the University of Victoria. He received, he's received countless awards for his, for his accomplishments. More recently, some of these include the Wollaston Medal Laureate of Geological Society of London in 2009, the Butcher Medalist of the American Geophysical Union in 2010, the Penrose Medal from the Geological Society of America in 2011, and in 2012, he was appointed an officer of the Order of Canada. Thanks everyone for coming. And now without any more, I'll let Dr. Hoffman give it a go. Okay, uh, good morning. <laughs> You'll notice that the uh, words um, evolution, uh, ecology, and paleontology did not appear anywhere in that introduction, and yet these are the topics of uh, uh, this morning's talk. Uh, this talk was prompted by a flurry of papers in the last half dozen years or so uh, from molecular uh, genomicists using an analytical technique uh, known variably as uh, trait habitat evolution or ancestral state reconstruction, uh, which, uh, uh, from which it is inferred that uh, uh, modern uh, primary producers, including cyanobacteria and their early algae, uh, evolved for most of their evolutionary history in freshwater, implying that uh, the planktonic marine environments were uh, more or less uninhabitable. But this seems to fly in the face of the, uh, of the marine fossil record from earlier in Precambrian time. And I'm going to suggest that we can reconcile these two views if we remember that all living organisms uh, descended from the survivors of the cryogenian snowball earth events. And uh, anything that did not survive <laughs> is, uh, is not, uh, does not register in, uh, in uh, living organisms which molecular genomicists study. And, uh, and so in this way, uh, uh, we can reconcile uh, these uh, two data sets, but this carries significant implications for the nature of the pre-cryogenian fossil record. So how did I get involved with this? Well, in, in 2012, on my way home from the field in Namibia, uh, I came home via London uh, because I wanted to attend the uh, firmer lecture on the Neoproterozoic Eon. And as I often uh, do in such uh, circumstances, I arranged a little lecture tour after the uh, meeting in London. I remember this lecture tour because I was carrying around this huge duffel with all my field gear, but I hardly had any presentable clothes. 
for the lectures themselves. Anyway, uh, after my talk at uh, Bristol University, which is over on the west coast of Southern England, um, Patricia Sanchez Bercaldo came up and introduced herself as a, um, uh, as a, uh, uh, as a molecular uh, genomicist interested in the phylogeny of cyanobacteria. And she said she had some interesting new data that she'd like to share with me if I had time to come over to her lab the next morning, which of course I did. And um, when I got there, she showed me essentially um, the uh, results that are shown on, on this figure here. And what she uh, had concluded is that major groups of modern marine planktonic cyanobacteria uh, had last common ancestors that uh, first appeared sometime in the Neoproterozoic, uh, sometime more or less around the Cryogenian, uh, although we can't be sure about the absolute ages. And uh, these groups include the, um, uh, the so-called synpro uh, clade of pico cyanobacteria, which are dominant prior produ primary producers in the, uh, in the modern gyres, and also some uh, major groups of, uh, of nitrogen fixers. Now, at that time, and I think maybe still, um, uh, 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 the size of oxygen uh, shown by this proxy date on the top, I've never been very impressed by such data because this seems to me to be a data set that separates lots of data from hardly any data at all rather than a rise of oxygen. And what they inferred from this was that um, uh, prior to uh, some type this, this, this radiation in marine environments, uh, the marine planktonic realm um, was poorly suited for, uh, uh, for phototrophs because of uh, uh, widespread uh, euxinia at that time and resulting uh, starvation in metal nutrients and H2S toxicity, blah, blah, blah. This, the idea of the so-called Canfield Ocean, which was popular for a while in the mid 1990s, but by 2012, most geologists had, uh, had rejected this notion because uh, large numbers of data sets were, were appearing, uh, indicating that euxinia uh, was, uh, was relatively local in the Proterozoic, uh, particularly in coastal environments where there are major inputs of uh, riverine sulfate. But uh, the abyss uh, remained ferruginous up until at least Ediacaran time. So there seemed to be a, a, a conflict here and, um, uh, but something else that, that she mentioned at that time, which was uh, sort of fascinating, but perplexing to me at the time, was that these last common ancestors seem to have evolved in freshwater environments rather than marine environments. So the green bars here indicate their earlier history in freshwater and they radiated according to these trade evolution uh, studies in marine environments only sometime after the, um, uh, the Neoproterozoic. And uh, more recently, uh, th this same inference has been extended from cyanobacteria to also include the, the early algae, the archaeplastids. That means the glaucophyte uh, algae, red algae, green algae, and their derivatives like, like land plants. So on this diagram here, uh, we can see in each one of these branching points, there's a little circle with uh, colors in it. And if it's mostly orange, that means it, uh, it is inferred to have been in freshwater. If it's blue, it's mostly in, in marine water. So over here, these are the Synpro uh, clade of the cyanobacteria. And then in the archaeplastids, these are the green algae. And uh, this is the great divide between the chlorophytes, which are mostly marine, and the streptophytes and the derived land plants, which are mostly freshwater. And sometime around this line here, is this great divide when after which there's this radiation into marine environments. But prior to that time, most of this evolutionary history was occurring in fresh water. Now this seems, as I, I mentioned, to fly in the face of the, uh, of the fossil record, uh, which, is, uh, you know, which is summarized here, divided between stem groups and crown groups. And as you can see, uh, we have uh, what are uh, thought to be uh, a crown group cyanobacteria going back to around 2 billion years ago, crown group uh, claimed to be crown group eukaryotes back to around 1 million years ago, and these are dominantly in marine environments. 
So for example, uh, here are the, um, uh, the Belcher Island, uh, uh, both filamentous and coccoid cyanobacteria, uh, especially the coccoid ones here, remarkably similar to modern uh, Entophysalis, which is a major marine uh, benthic uh, uh, coccoid cyanobacterium. And these are definitely in, uh, in marine deposits, and they're now well dated around 2016 million years ago by the work of Malcolm Hodgkiss and co-authors uh, published recently. So we have a very long record of, uh, of, of cyanobacteria in the marine environment. And similarly uh, with eukaryotic algae, we have the uh, famous uh, Bangiomorpha, um, uh, claimed to be a Bangiophyte, a crown group, a red algae, uh, now dated by Tim Gibson from Halverson's group at uh, around 2040 or 1040 uh, million years, uh, years ago. Uh, this is a multicellular red alga. Uh, we have also described originally by <clears throat> Nick Butterfield, Proteroclatus, uh, thought to be a Clodophrin uh, crown group green alga, <clears throat> now in much better preserved material uh, from uh, uh, Northeast China um, in, uh, in sediments around 1 billion years old. So here we have examples and also both of these are in marine environments. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now there are uh, uh, groups that uh, may well have become extinct, so like these phosphatic scale microfossils from around 810 million years ago in northwestern Canada. Um, these are not known in post-Tonian time, uh, so there may well be forms that are extinct, but there are these ones that are claimed to be crown groups, and that would seem to be in contradiction uh, with the fossil record. And so a statement such as this from this uh, 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 2016 paper that both cyanobacteria and eukaryotic algae appear to have been in freshwater ecosystems for much of Earth history and only in the Proterozoic and Phanerozoic are marine and planktonic species seen. This just seems to be incompatible with the fossil record. So now I think that we can reconcile these if we remember this truism, okay? Truism is thing that's uh, almost true by definition. So all living things descended from the survivors of cryogenian glaciations, okay? So long as you accept that there were cryogenian glaciations, um, this statement has to be true. So what do we know about the nature of cryogenian glaciations? Now, of course, uh, uh, over the last six years or so, the snowball earth hypothesis has become widely accepted because uh, most of its major predictions have turned out to be true. We have good geochemical evidence uh, uh, that there were extremely high concentrations of carbon dioxide which are required to get out of snowball earth and which shouldn't evolve otherwise. Um, we know that these were long lived. We know from geochronology that uh, the onset and the terminations of both the Sturdy and the Maranoan glaciations were pretty much uh, synchronous uh, globally on different cratons. So people now accept the snowball earth hypothesis, but I'm not sure that everyone is, uh, is really dealing with the implications of this. So let's summarize about the cryosphere under snowball earth conditions and what we know. And this is largely from geophysical modeling. Let's look at the marine first and the top is, the, is a summary of, uh, of, of the continental ice situation. In the marine environment, very quickly, once the ocean freezes over, within a few thousand years, the ice gets really thick hundreds of meters. And as a result, it flows under its own weight and it tends to close off any area of open water that might tend to open. And as a result, over most of, uh, you know, uh, millions to tens of millions of years, the entire ocean is covered by, uh, by a, a dynamic sea glacier that's uh, hundreds of meters thick. So there's no possibility of doing photosynthesis under this ice sheet. There are cracks, but the cracks are extremely deep because of the thick ice and they're pretty much uh, dark. Now notice that the dynamic here, notice also that the ice is pretty even in thickness and that's because of the dynamic flow. And this is being driven by a very, very strong uh, Hadley uh, uh, cell uh, in, the, uh, in the summer hemisphere. Uh, which rocks back and forth, moving well off the equator uh, with the seasons. And the net result is that there's a strong zone of net ablation, which straddles the equator, and then, and then net accumulation in the subtropics. And that's driving 
uh, this flow and also provides the water vapor for the growth of continental ice sheets. So within a few hundred thousand years after the ocean freezes over, uh, the continents become uh, fairly uh, well covered by ice. But this recent study, this is from the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, Ben's paper in, in 2015. The modeling here is from Guillaume Leir. And uh, this is the first modeling that, uh, that uh, uh, ran the continental ice sheets to, uh, to a steady state at different levels of CO2 corresponding to this full snowball cycle from very low levels at the beginning to very high levels at the end. And what was really surprising about this study was that the areas of, of, uh, that were ice free a bare ground, instead of getting smaller over time, as, as I and I think most people expected, I thought the continents would become completely covered. In fact, although the continental ice sheets are moving faster, the area of bare ground, and notice it's concentrated along the equator, gets larger and larger. And this is exactly where this Hadley cells, and therefore the surface winds in the summer hemisphere are very strong. And so that means that there's going to be a lot of dust. Now, I think there's good geological support for this idea that there were areas of bare ground. So for example, Tony Spencer in his magnificent memoir from 1971 showed in the Port Eskeg Formation, sturdy and in the Dalradian Northwest Scotland, 14 successive till sheets, each one of which is, it has at the top these polygonal sand wedges, which indicate a periglacial environment free of ice. So we have 14 successive advances and retreats of an ice margin across the Dalradian shelf. And um, this work from, uh, from Max de Nu in West Africa, once again, uh, periglacial sand wedges indicating ice-free ground uh, right underneath, uh, directly overlain by the cap dolomite. And then in South Australia, once again, we have sand wedges, these described by George Williams, overlain by aeolian deposits, aeolian sand dune deposits. Notice that the southeast directed winds here make no sense in the, uh, in the low northern, any northern or southern latitudes. This is in the trade wind belt. So these winds that are moving against the trade wind orientation are almost certainly catabatic winds. Those are winds that are coming down off a major ice sheet here in the northwestern part of Australia, uh, probably flowing across a coastal dry valley area like the McMurdo Dry Valleys in East Antarctica. So what we know, if you've ever visited a glacier, you know that when the wind blows, it's a really dusty place. So there's lots of dust and that's because glaciers erode by two mechanisms, by abrasion, which produces rock powder and by quarrying, which, which produces you know, blocky rock debris and erratics and whatnot. Hence the diamictites, which are the characteristic glacial deposits. Now this dust is extremely important. It's important in the air, it's important on the ground. It falls on either on the ground or on the ice. Most most of the snowball earth is covered by ice. So it falls on the ice, gets entrained in the ice. This dust is from a glacial loose, we know is can be extremely widespread. And uh, in Antarctica, you don't really think of it as a very dusty place. But if you look at the Antarctic glaciers at the, at the ice fronts, they're full of dust that's coming out. And the significance of this dust is that in the ablation zones of glaciers, this dust all comes up to the surface and forms these clumps of dust called cryoconite, meaning ice dust, and that absorbs sunlight and you get little bits of water and it gets in, 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 in inhabited by cyanobacteria. And because it's a very bright environment, the cyanobacteria are producing extracellular substance, which is heavily pigmented. And that makes it darker still. So you get more sunlight absorption of, of solar energy. And as a result, the ablation zones of all glaciers virtually worldwide, alpine, high, you know, north, south, polar latitudes, are, are just peppered with these cryoconite holes that are about a half a meter deep and in summer are filled with liquid water, liquid meltwater. And these are very interesting ecological communities. The dust is about 10% uh, sugar produced by cyanobacteria. And they're also inhabited by green algae, I mean, eukaryotic algae, but exclusively greens and heterotrophs like fungi and protists and even some derived uh, 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 metazoans. So this is a very interesting uh, environment and it's freshwater based. Now on ice shelves, 
where the water doesn't drain so effectively, these aren't just little holes, but these form lakes, ice covered lakes, but with meltwater underneath, the ice covers are very thin. And so there's active photosynthesis here. And uh, as, as recent, more, you know, 20 years ago, Warwick Vincent, who is a New Zealander who spent 25 years in the McMurdo uh, Dry Valley area and McMurdo Ice Shelf in Antarctica before moving to uh, Canada to study the uh, high uh, uh, Canadian Arctic ice shelves, was saying already 20 years ago uh, that these superglacial meltwater-based environments are where cyanobacteria photo and eukaryotic phototrophs and heterotrophs heterotroph depended on them would have survived and evolved during, during Snowball Earth. So we have a very important environment in Snowball Earth, which is dominantly a meltwater-based uh, uh, ecosystem. Now, I want to remind you of the time scale of these events. So here I've drawn the cryogenian time scale next to the Cenozoic time scale. So you can see that in combination, the cryogenian goes from today well back into the Cretaceous. So the Sturdian, 56 million years in duration, that's equivalent to most of the Cenozoic. Now, if you consider that the dust accumulation rates during the last glacial maximum in Antarctica uh, work out to an equivalent of one to 10 meters per million years. <laughs> we, there's a potential problem here that uh, if, if the whole world's dust that gets entrained in the ice and that ice is flowing towards the equatorial ablation zone and is accumulating here, the whole ablation zone should get completely covered by dust, by meters of dust. And if that happens, the ice actually does, won't ablate anymore because it's insulated by the dust and we never get out of Snowball Earth. So there has to be some mechanism of getting rid of this dust, and indeed there is. And that's a result because this meltwater, it collects and there are drainages that develop. These drainages find cracks, they flow down through the cracks, they open up because of the latent heat that cracks and form these moulins, which are flushing conduits into which the meltwater flows. And this meltwater flow then that cleanses the ice. And there's an interesting feedback because of the ice, the dust builds up, you get melt more, more meltwater. And so then that cleans the surface off, increases the albedo and makes it colder again. And so there's a, it sort of self adjusts to maintain the situation for long periods of time until there gets to be so much meltwater that it actually starts to perforate the ice and then breaks open as Yong Gang Yu has recently written about. Okay, now I happen to think that this uh, melt, this moulin flushing is extremely important because remember, it's flushing this cryokinite, which is 10% organic matter. And, and, and the hypersaline ocean underneath here is extremely cold. So respiration rates would have been very low, slow because the temperatures here are minus three, minus four degrees. And that means there's gonna be organic burial and therefore oxygen production. And this is essential that you have some way of producing oxygen to counter the, um, uh, the consumption of oxygen by uh, volcanic gases and, uh, and, and seafloor weathering. Now, uh, I've stressed here uh, the freshwater-based environments uh, uh, where organisms would survive in Snowball Earth, but I also want to look at uh, environments that are, that are uh, uh, open for phototrophs in the continental environment, because these are very interesting ones and include not only freshwater, but also hypersaline. So in coastal areas and the equatorial area of ablation would be dotted with these lakes, these ice-covered lakes. And these ice covers are thin, so there's lots of photosynthesis going on under the ice, primary production, and then also uh, heterotrophs as, as a result. And these communities also would end up in the ocean um, when the snowball melts, because all these coastal regions get flooded during the great uh, post-snowball post um, marine transgression. So these lakes are very interesting. Um, they're they're uh, recharged uh, by uh, by meltwater from the adjacent glaciers. Uh, there's very strong ablation here, and so the water becomes hypersaline. And as a result of that, the ice covers are thin. They're clear, so there's lots of photosynthesis under under the ice. So there are enormous concentrations of uh, planktonic picocyanobacteria, like the modern cyan, and, and also nitrogen fixing uh, benthic. Uh, 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 cyanobacteria. And these are in fact fascinating environments. So this is Lake Vanda in, um, in, 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 in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. 
and it's uh, meromictic lake. That means it's salt stratified. So at the top, you have cold oxygenated freshwater, and this has one organic community. Then there's a convecting the thermohaline convecting cell. Okay, and so there's another organic community here. Then there's a halocline where the salinity starts to increase. And at the bottom, you have a totally anoxic H2 H rich brine, which is warm. Look at these temperatures, up to 25 degrees down here. So I have this really weird situation where you have this warm water down at the bottom and cold water at the top. And of course, the reason is that the, that the, the, uh, the, the stratification is controlled by, by the salinity. So this is very saline. And uh, so uh, I'm gonna ask you a question. Guess where the, uh, the maximum chlorophyll counts are the, uh, and, and the richest concentrations of, uh, of, um, uh, of cyanobacteria primary producers? Well, <laughs> they're right down here. And they're down here in part because this is the most nutrient rich environment. This is a nutrient limiting, uh, the limited uh, uh, ecosystem and also because it's warm. So experiments show that although these are, are, are cryotolerant cyanobacteria and, 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 uh, and also green algae, they nevertheless do much better when it's warm. So they're sort of pre-adapted for the, uh, uh, the warm snowball aftermath. And so here are a couple of pictures. Uh, this is uh, from uh, 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 of some of the be uh, the benthic uh, um, uh, mats, microbial mats, and then uh, in uh, in Ace Lake uh, over in the Indian Ocean sector of Antarctica, which has been studied for a long time. This is Senecococcus, is one of these major picocyanobacteria. These are in concentrations up to 15 million cells per milliliter. <laughs> so this is an enormous concentration. Ace Lake in summer has 15 times higher concentration of, uh, of Synechococcus than any, anywhere in the modern world. And this is uh, Synechococcus uh, prochlorococcus, the synprochlator responsible for something like 12% of global uh, primary uh, production. And yet in summer, uh, these meromictic lakes are just teeming with this stuff. Notice incidentally that the polar oceans have almost none of these because they just can't compete with diatoms. All right, okay. So uh, now when snowball earth is over, um, these freshwater based superglacial uh, ecosystems and these meromictic lake ecosystems, then of course find themselves in the ocean. And for about 50,000 years or so, this ocean is highly stratified because the, the, the ice melts extremely rapidly, probably one or 2,000 years at the, you know, at, the out, at the outside, even with modern day melting rates, we'll get rid of all this ice in, in 3,000 years. And so you end up with this highly stratified ocean in which you have uh, meltwater sitting on top of icy cold brine, just is being heated by this uh, you know, potentially 50, 100,000 ppm CO2 atmosphere. And so it takes uh, on the time scale of, of, you know, isostatic adjustment, uh, tens of thousands of years for this to destratify. So, the, so the, these organisms have a little bit of time to adjust to, uh, to normal seawater conditions. So what I'm saying is that uh, what we have today <laughs> uh, descended from, uh, you know, what survived Snowball Earth. And here they are, these, uh, the, uh, these uh, um, Sinpro, and they're of course uh, dominant in the gyres because they do best uh, under oligotrophic conditions and in nutrient rich polar waters, they, uh, they can't compete with the, uh, with the more derived uh, uh, eukaryotic algae. Okay, so let's come back to this figure again. So what I'm suggesting is that these uh, radiations into marine environment are post snowball and uh, the, these are uh, what we see in the modern organisms. And uh, because this, the, what we have today derives from those organisms which before snowball were probably in the polar regions or in alpine glaciers, those specialists. And when snowball hit, you know, their ecosystem greatly expanded. And so they took over. And these were, those were the ones that survived. And so naturally, uh, 
they carry the ancestry of those uh, freshwater superglacial environments. And when we get to know this ancestry better, I suspect we'll start to see uh, these environments represented in the Meromictic lakes, uh, represented in the modern organisms as well. So what about that fossil record of, uh, of you know, all these marine uh, uh, cyanobacteria and eukaryotes? Well, the point is that uh, this is another truism. There are no living descendants of clades that failed to survive the cryogenian glaciations. So what that implies then is that these marine fossils, many of them, they cannot be crown groups. They have to be stem groups. In other words, sure, I, unlike what the biologists say, we know from the fossil record that uh, there were eukaryotes, there were cyanobacteria, Probably, although the fossil record of plankton is not very good, we have good, reasonable fossil record for, for benthic organisms, but not so good for, plank, for plankton. But we could imagine that there were uh, marine plankton, but, uh, but that they're, they're stem groups. So I'll show this diagram. This is an interesting paper by, uh, uh, by Burkhardt Becker back in 2013. And he looked at this great divide in the green algae between the marine dominant chlorophytes and the freshwater streptophytes. And he said, well, this divide is probably a product of snowball earth. <laughs> Makes sense because snowball earth is this extremely binary uh, salinity situation. You're either in fresh water or you're in a you know, brine ice covered lake. And, uh, but nobody believes this, uh, this story. And the reason is because of these fossils. If you accept that this, is a, a, this proterocletus is a cladophorum, that's a, that's a crown group. It's a crown group ovophysian. And that's a highly derived clade. And so this is a billion years old. And so if this is really a crown group, then that pushes the whole, uh, the whole green algal tree back into the Mesoproterozoic, okay? Now, these authors, and I credit these authors, these authors have been very careful in expressing their preferred interpretation that this is indeed a crown group. However, they express, you know, a proper degree of caution because no matter how beautifully preserved these are, and these are really exquisitely preserved, they're so much more complete than the Svanberg fillet material that uh, Nick Butterfield originally, the original proterocletus. But nevertheless, even despite the fact that it's clearly multicellular, they're well-preserved, the, you know, the branching, there's hold fast. Nevertheless, these are still morphologically simple forms and they're presumably adaptive. So why couldn't they be products of convergent evolution. In other words, this is not potentially a crown group, but a stem group. And the cladophorans are crown groups that converge morphologically into this type of morphology, but not as a result of direct uh, ancestry, okay? Now, similarly with the Bangiomorpha, uh, although this has been the poster child for you know, early eukaryotic algae crown groups, uh, this interpretation has recently been severely criticized by these authors on this uh, a nice paper on the phylogeny of fluoridophyte uh, red algae. And they point out that most of the, uh, the, the features which Nick Butterfield used to identify these as bangiophyte crown groups are actually basal and appear in a number of red algal groups. And so they question the interpretation of this as, as a crown group. Okay, so now is there any kind of independent evidence uh, that we can then look to as a hint of where we might go uh, to look for evidence that these marine uh, plankton in pre-cryogenian times were different from modern ones? So uh, I'm gonna first point out that in, in this nice paper, uh, one of a cluster of papers now from Jochen Brox's group, uh, this one on the rise of algae. Now, the main point of this paper was that uh, uh, just before the Maranoan glaciation, there is a, a large and permanent increase in the ratio of stearines to hopanes. Hopanes are produced by, by, uh, cy by bacteria, stearines by eukaryotic algae. And so the rise of algae is this big increase in stearines relative to hopanes, indicating for the first time and for this time forward, uh, algae were, ma were uh, well, major importance in marine primary uh, production. Now, what I wanna point out here is that stearines were not absent in pre-cryogenian time. They are present, 
but there are these weird ones, cryostane, which are not known to be uh, produced by any modern organism or any, any modern eukaryote. And so this is a hint now that the eukaryotic primary producers before the cryogenian were different from those that occurred subsequently. Now there's this paper that just came out and I've read this, I don't know, six or seven times now and I'm still trying to digest it. But what these authors point out um, uh, is that if you look at um, epsilon, that is the difference between uh, carbonate and organic matter, uh, delta C13, um, in, in a carefully selected and, uh, and, and, and statistically analyzed data set, the distribution of this epsilon, this, this uh, uh, difference between the, uh, uh, the inorganic and the organic carbon, uh, has a wide range with, uh, with uh, uh, around uh, 16 uh, uh, per mil. And uh, this cannot be accounted for by uh, production by the, uh, uh, by the modern synpro, which dominate planktonic production in the modern ocean, which has a much, much tighter um, distribution of this. And uh, however, these authors uh, make an argument, it's a rather involved argument, that the most likely uh, uh, producer to produce this are what are called uh, beta cyanobacteria. These are cyanobacteria with a different type of carb of, of, of a CO2 uh, concentrating mechanism, the beta um, uh, uh, carbo uh, carboxylase. Um, See, I have to laugh here. CCMs are in, in where I come from, are, are, are our make of hockey skate. <laughs> Every kid wanted tacks, you know, tacaberries, which are the high line CCMs. Anyway, carbonate, carbon concentrating mechanisms. Um, they argue that, uh, that the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the cyanobacteria uh, in planktonic environments responsible for, for uh, marine primary production in the mesoproterozoic between 1.8 and 1.0 billion years ago was basically physiologically different from, from those in, uh, in, 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 in today and in post cryogenian time. So that's another hint uh, that things were different. Now I haven't, I've talked mostly about phototrophs because they're the most challenging for snowball earth. I should say something about heterotrophs. So this reminds me of this interesting paper that came, came out uh, a few, quite a few years ago now um, in which um, a, a, a group from Boston and, um, and, and Copenhagen uh, went to Disco Island in Greenland and sampled a tidal flat here and looked at the protus and, uh, and, and they compared it with the, uh, in, in terms of the uh, uh, ribosomal RNA gene diversity, they compared it with other, uh, with protists in, in other habitats and, you know, hot springs and tropical coasts and all sorts of other ones. And the, unexpectedly, as they say, the Arctic community emerged as one of the richest in terms of gene diversity and most diverse in ancestral lineages. It's not what they expected at all. And they went into a long thing about how, you know, cold environments are always persisted and whatnot. I would say this is a, this is a vestige of, the, of that very, very ancient uh, um, ecosystem, you know, usually a relatively minor one, but the one that became the incubator for everything uh, during the snowball earth situation. And so everything after, and so naturally, uh, you know, by the standards of everything else, and not everything survived the greenhouse snowball aftermath, th this is relatively diverse, and particularly diverse in, in very ancient uh, lineages. Now, while we're on the subject of heterotrophs, what about uh, multicellular animals? Well, I, th I think the Cam Cambrian conundrum still exists, because, uh, you know, the, the molecular clocks say that we should have, uh, be having fossils back here, but you know, I I I agree. I don't think there's uh, you know any real evidence for crown group uh, metazoans until uh, the late Ediacaran at, uh, at the earliest. So uh, you know, Doug Irwin told me that Snowball Earth is problematic for early um, uh, metazoans because uh, most you know you know most sponges. Incidentally, uh, you know, for a while we thought we had biomarker evidence for demo sponges, but back to back to here. But it looks like that's out the window now. Um, he said there's, there's a problem because primitive demo sponges lack a regulatory mechanism for 
uh, for, for controlling intracellular inter, inter, inter salinity. And so this, uh, you know, snowball earth is not going to be a very happy place for them um, because there's every, you know, there's every kind of salinity except normal seawater under, under that condition. So maybe snowball earth uh, actually uh, might help to account for the delayed appearance of multicellular animals. Okay, now I think that but some paleontologists are not going to be very happy if I tell them that they don't have crown groups, but they have stem groups. But I think they should look at the bright side of it. Uh, and, and let's remember that, bi that biologists, and we're trying to get, you know, work with, together here with biologists because, you know, bi 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 biology is, the, you know, particularly molecular biology is the engine of science these days and will be for some time. Remember, biologists first got interested in fossils um, you know, when it was first recognized that, that most fossils represent extinct organisms. Before that time, no biologist would look at a fossil. Why, why would you study a fossil when you have living, living creatures? And it was only when it was realized that fossils represent a record, the only record we have of, of former worlds uh, populated by animals and plants that no longer exist. That's when biologists got interested in fossils. So I'm saying the same thing about the pre-cryogenian record, except instead of having extinct taxa, we're looking at extinct clades, okay? So I think we have a really a great opportunity here um, for geology and biology uh, to work together to really sort out what the, <laughs> the significance of, of, of snowball earth is as, a, as an incubator for the, for, for the post cryogenian biosphere. And it's a wonderful one because geologists have to work together with geophysicists to understand the environment and, and the potential ecosystems under Snowball Earth and its aftermath. And we have to work with, um, uh, with paleontologists and, and with molecular phylogenomicists and, uh, and polar ecologists. So it's a, it's a great thing if you believe in the principle of scientific trespass, as uh, G.K. Gilbert called it. Okay, with that, I hope uh, left a few minutes for questions. Yeah, that was great. Um, we've already got a question for you actually right in the chat. Um, and anybody else who is ready to ask questions, please go ahead and either, again, type your question into the chat or uh, if you would rather ask it in person, go ahead and uh, type a star and uh, we'll direct you to, uh, to ask your question. First, Ben Freeman asks, uh, for, my, for my simple geologist mind, can you please elaborate on distinction and the distinction and definition of crown versus stem groups, namely how such knowledge gaps still exist in our understanding of evolutionary histories and how we might fill these gaps? Well, crown groups, uh, 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 crown groups are, are, are groups that have direct descendants in, uh, in, in living taxa, whereas st stem groups are, are clades uh, that do not have uh, uh, direct descendants uh, because, because of extinction. And uh, the problem is that if you go to Namibia, you see uh, uh, plants there that look exactly like cactus in the southwestern U.S., but they're completely unrelated to cactus. So that's an example of uh, evolutionary morphological convergence, as it's called, where you get similar looking forms because they're adapted to a similar environment, but they have a completely unrelated uh, uh, phylogeny or gen genetic ancestry. And so it's a problem in paleo for paleontologists when you're dealing with, uh, you know, with relatively simple uh, microscopic forms uh, to distinguish crown groups and, and, and from stem groups. So is there, is there a way um, through I don't know, molecular descriptions to actually d distinguish between the two? I mean, is there, are we, is the biological community able to address some of those uh, morphological complexities? Is there other ways to answer those questions? Like some progress has been made on that, as a matter of fact, and this is mostly with the Ediacara soft-bodied, um, uh, you know, animals, uh, stem, once again, stem group or crown group. And, uh, and, and there's been some success, actually, in doing biomarkers on uh, organic matter that seems to be associated with, uh, for example, the uh, uh, Dickinsonia. And, uh, uh, and, and so I think we, you know, and so that uh, gives us an, a, another... Uh, another data set. 
Now, uh, the reason I'm stressing this crown group, um, um, stem group uh, business is that the molecular clocks, these are these phylogenetic trees based on the, on the uh, uh, gene sequences of living organisms to calibrate those against time. These days, instead of just making assumptions about uh, mutation rates, they calibrate them relative to the fossil record. So it's absolutely critical in this calibration as to whether something is a crown group or, or, or a, a, a stem group, as I used with the example of, the, uh, of Boris Becker's, uh, you know, the great divide in the green algae. And so if we misidentify, if we call something a crown group that was actually a stem group, it throws the, uh, the molecular clocks uh, out of kilter. And the insidious thing about it is that when you calibrate the clocks with the fossil record, of course, everything becomes more consistent. The clocks and the fossil record agree. And so people are happy, but you've given up something. You've given up the independence. And the whole point of tests and testing in science is you must test an observation or an inference with a new data that is independent of the original data. Okay, and so in giving up that independence, you've sacrificed a lot in my view. Great, that was fantastic, thank you. All right, uh, Jin Jin Liu has a question, if you wanna unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Hi, Paul, uh, nice talk as always. Yeah. Uh, for questions, uh, we are actually doing, uh, so right now we are doing an experiment trying to show how the cyanobacteria um, uh, varies in ox oxygen yield rate under different silica conditions, because we believe that uh, uh, silica might be might be toxic to them, and we need more energy to to keep the silica away from this from the from the from the cell wall. So I was wondering, do we have any geological evidence to show that? I mean, during and after the the Snowball Earth, you have significant variation in the seawater silicon concentrations. Yeah, so that's a, that, that's an interesting question. Um, so. And it's a tricky one because, of course, carbonate production. So, so our best measure of, of silica is the amount of chert in, in, in carbonate. Um, and the chert, you know, forms, it's a secondary phase, but it's, you know, it's ultimately coming from seawater. And so the problem is that in the snowball aftermath, um, you know, of course, you're drawing down CO2. So you're doing a lot of silicate weathering. And so you're getting a big pulse of uh, alkalinity as well as you know, silicic acid. So they're both going up. So you don't see such a big, a notable change in the, uh, in the ratio. That is in the immediate aftermath. In the 10 million years or so, it takes for the CO2 to be drawn down. It takes quite a long time because you know, you, 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 the weathering, the problem is the weathering reaches uh, uh, you know, a limit. You, you get a you know, fully weathered uh, weathering zone and then ultimately to, wet, to, to get, get more weathering, you have to have tectonics that, that, that advects fresh rock into the weathering zone. So perhaps you could get somewhere by comparing the amount of chert in the Ediacaran after that first 10 million years, after the snowball aftermath with what you see perhaps in the, in, in the Tonian. I don't have enough experience personally uh, with the middle and late Ediacaran, I think my, you know, my impression from field trips and when looking at the Nama, looking at the Doshantuo, Dunying, uh, these are some of the Ediacaran carbonates I'm familiar with, that there's, I think you could make a case that there's less, that there's less silica. And uh, so personally, of course, because I'm attracted to this idea of the, uh, of the stable uh, protozoic climate being related to higher silica concentrations and the presence of reverse weathering. Because of course that requires that you have to have a warmer climate to keep the carbon, you know, the geochemical carbon cycle in balance. And so I'd, I'd love to see uh, <laughs> some uh, means of drawing down silica, uh, you know, around cryogenian time. But uh, that would be a good project. I can only speak to it anecdotally. Thanks. All right, uh, Jean Bedard asks, uh, as ancient oceans would have been much less saline, what is the significance of the marine or non-marine distinction in the early, early Proterozoic and Archean? 
I assume that on average, the oceans have approximately the same salinity throughout Earth history, because of course the salinity is ultimately limited by the precipitation of evaporites. So, you know, similarly to with alkalinity and carbonate, um, the salinity is gonna vary mostly because the salt comes out in big dumps. So you get a big dump and so salinity goes down and it builds back up again. That, but it's limited by, by evaporate deposition. Now, I don't see any reason why salinity should have been greatly different. Now, the exception of course, is that 50,000 years after the snowball when of course the ocean would have had a lake on top of it. Um, can I say something as a follow-up? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Craig, go right ahead. Well, I mean, our cells are adapted to uh, uh, an ocean saline content that, that's less than it is now. I mean, fish cells, the, the cells of fish are adapted to less saline water than they're, they're swimming in. So all of us have inherited this, this ancestry that equilibrated with a less saline ocean. I was just wondering, and uh, in the Archean, most of the continents were submarine and there were no evaporites. So all these, these systems you speak of are, are plausible for now, but in the Archean, they probably didn't work and the water was probably much less saline. So what does it actually mean that this, the ancestry of all life is, is uh, towards fresher water? Could that not just be an inheritance from a less saline initial ocean? What it means, Jean, is that you are not a marine creature. <laughs> <laughs> See, the point is that you came from a croconite pond. That's the point. No, I, I agree. I think you make a really, really good point. But you mustn't forget that all the life that went into this cryogenian masher had also survived all the previous trials and tribulations and heating events and this, that, and the other thing. And uh, if you filter out anything that doesn't survive in a lake, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there were pre-existing organisms that were in equilibrium with very saline seawater. Yeah, but there were always glaciers, okay? Because there've always been mountains, there've always been glaciers. And so that, that periglacial environment and superglacial environment in the ablation zone, you know, which is the one that took over in Snowball, that, that's been there throughout Earth history. Oh, I'm not and it uh, has this deep ancestry. And then, you know, as a result of this, you know, the contingency of, of the Snowball Earth, that ended up, you know, you, they were pre adapt Remember, Snowball starts very fast. If you're living in the tropics, it's only a few thousand years. And so the, the organisms that were pre-adapted, those are the ones that succeeded. And, 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 and afterwards, they give rise to everything, you know, that then followed. And so we're looking, we're all derived from this rather specialized ecosystem, which, which you know, had survived, you know, has been there and, and evolved slowly over the billions of years because, you know, because of mountains, there've always been glaciers and it's always been pretty cold at the poles. My only question is when you refer to the ancient marine life, if that seawater was less saline, is there a real distinction between seawater and freshwater in the Archean? We have no idea. We can't say because the modern organisms, those are, you know, don't, as far as we know, we may find them. But so to date, we have not recognized the descendants, you know, any descendants of those pre cryogenian oceans. Okay. So we don't, we have no data in which to say anything about uh, pre-cryogenian uh, uh, seawater salinity. And therefore, I've argued from first principles that it was probably you know, broadly similar to today on average. But of course it's variable because, of the, because salt comes in steadily, but goes out in pulses. So I think that you know, the salinity of the ocean is, is mostly a, a short-term fluctuations you know, around a, you know, a long-term you know, pretty stable mean. That's, a, that's a first principles argument. I'm not a Jew. <laughs> Once again, I'm out of my depth here, but that's my sense. As am I. <laughs> All right, great. I, I think our next question is from Shu Hai Zhao. So Shu Hai, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, thanks, Alex. And thank you very much, Paul. Uh, very insightful talk. 
Um, I, I would like to ask a question about your uh, uh, distinction between STEM and the Quran. Um, my understanding is that you know, basically every fossil is a STEM group at one level or another. Uh, for example, you know, dinosaurs are STEM group birds and the Ediacaran fossils, there's, you know, if you agree that the STEM, STEM group animals, uh, but they are crown group eukaryotes. So I think your argument, uh, even if the, you know, the cryogenium purge of marine organisms uh, did happen, uh, it does not by itself uh, exclude some of the crown group uh, at one level or another. I'll give you an example, for, for example, Bangiomorpha. Uh, you argue that it must be a stem group red algae, a red alga. It might be true, uh, but you can keep it as a crown as long as you um, make your purge of a cryogenic purge of a, a red algae, uh, not at the stem, not at the at the stem of a red algae, but you know at an upper level. So you can, I think that that actually help your argument because there's an independent purge of marine. Uh, Bankiophytes and the marine foridiophytes, the other major group of uh, red, red algae. So it's independent events rather than you know, one single purge at, at the deeper phylogenetic level. I don't yeah. know whether I've made myself clear, but right, you know, right. my, my point well, is well, that. Right. Snowball was not the only thing that ever happened, of course, not the only extinction. And um, and of course, there were two of them. And of course, I also agree that we're all crown groups in the sense that, you know, if, we, if, 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 uh, if we all descended from a single organism, then, uh, you know, we're obviously all related. Uh, so my concern about stem group versus crown group was mostly a, a, an operational one as, as far as uh, uh, calibrating molecular clocks and, and therefore the trees. And uh, because people otherwise are going to, you know, clearly point to the, to the uh, calibrated trees and say, no, there's a mismatch in the timing between the, you know, when, when the purge occurred according to the snowball earth hypothesis and uh, when it occurred, you know, apparent, according to some other hypothesis, if it occurred at all. So that, that's my concern is mostly about the, uh, the use of the fossil record in the, in the calibration. I think we should just keep an open mind uh, uh, uh about that and uh everything else you say i, I i've said I, I think you stated it very well okay thanks paul all right well with that that puts us right at nine o'clock and i don't want to start testing the limits of our of our large meeting pass so i know that several of you several more of you have asked more questions and i'm sure they would have generated great uh discussion and this has been great yeah, you contact me by email. Paul exactly. F. Hoffman, one word, Paul F. Hoffman at Gmail. Okay, and I can send an email announcement out with your, your email in it in case people are looking for that, um, if that's okay with you. Uh, so this, mm, all right, so th thank you everybody for showing up and it's been a great first round. So we're looking forward to having you all return and uh, and uh, keep an eye out for announcements and an eye on the, the website, and we'll see you in two weeks. Great.